welcome to the Adventures with Grammy podcast. I am your host, Carolyn Berry. This podcast is for grandparents on the go with their grandchildren and for parents who want to ensure loving relationships across the generations. I welcome your feedback and your input on every episode of the podcast we produce. Please send me an email, carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com. Now sit back with your favorite beverage and enjoy today's episode. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's a favorite question adults often ask children. A question today's guests encourage you to ask your children and grandchildren and then discuss with them the thousands of career options available. This episode of the Adventures with Grammy podcast will focus on the importance of early career exploration and how to graduate from college debt-free. My guests are Robin Mitchell, an elementary counselor who works for King George County Public Schools in Virginia, and Denise Thomas, international best-selling author, TEDx speaker, creator of Cracking the Code to Free College, CEO of Get Ahead of the Class, and host of Your College Fast Pass, a national online conference for parents and students. For today's literary segment, I will suggest a few books to help our grandchildren get an early look at career options. Regardless if your children want to work in the medical field, operate heavy equipment, own their own businesses, or work in careers that don't even yet exist, my wish for your grandchildren and mine is for them to dream big, learn about themselves so they choose career paths that will lead to fulfilling personal and professional lives. My guest for the adventure segment of this episode is Robin Mitchell. I met Robin when we worked at King George High School She was the director of counseling. I was the department chair for special education. We worked together to help our students explore careers and develop educational plans that would allow them to transition smoothly from high school to adult life. She is a firm believer that talking about careers at home is the best first step in a child's path to a successful career. Welcome, Robin, to the Adventures with Grammy podcast. I am a huge proponent of early career exploration. How important is that for elementary school students, and what does it look like for children that age? It's so important that every year that our, that students are in school, that they are developing knowledge about what a career is and what variety of careers exist. At the elementary level, it's a lot of fun because um, at kindergarten, we start with community helpers and they start realizing that these helpers in the community, that is their career, that term career, with grandparents talking about what a career is and what the careers are of the people in their lives. So maybe the career that the grandparent had, telling stories, maybe even doing some role play about what that career looks like. And then when going places, talking to people and exposing the students, not only to the individual at those places, but what does it mean for what they do during the day? So not just going to the grocery store to buy the groceries, but what does the cashier do during the day? All of those things could be woven in to -to day-to-day experiences. Here at school, our plan is to have a career fair. We haven't had it the past couple of years because of COVID, but the plan is to bring people into the building and also expose them to that. But I would love to see more of our students come to school with an understanding of what their parents or guardians or grandparents do. Many times when they get here, they have no idea what their parents are doing during the day because they're not having those conversations yet. When I was a high school counselor, I would often ask the kids if they knew what their parents do for a living and then do their parents look happy when they go to work in the morning? And that was always an interesting question to ask because many of them perceived their parents as not being joyful about going to work. Then I know most people are not overly joyful, but the work should bring them some happiness a sense of pride. And the students did not perceive that their parents were fulfilled 
by their jobs. And I would ask them to consider what kind of job they would have that would bring them a sense of fulfillment or pride or joy when they went to work in the morning. For high school kids, there was a program called Virginia Wizard that helped assess Mm -hmm. a a child's values and interests. Does something like that exist for elementary school children? It does. So Virginia View was the one that we had used for years. It was a fantastic program and it had the assessments that asked those very basic questions. You know, do you enjoy um, woodworking? And they would check that. And, you know, do you want to work outside? And they would check that. And at the end, it would give them that information for younger students. Unfortunately, it's currently not um, operational. So we're eager to get that back. Do you know what other states are doing? Other states do have similar programs that they use. I think it is a mistake to tell children everybody has to go to college. It is, one, expensive. Two, it really leads to what we saw years ago when there was a dearth of trades and to find an electrician or a plumber was almost impossible at times. I think that's a wonderful thought. I am also not a proponent of every child needs to go to college. At the high school level in particular, we would work through interest and and whether they truly relate to a college program or to a trade school. And I think a lot of children, whatever age that starts, feel pressured, whether they feel pressured from family or they feel pressured from friends. I find a lot of times by the time they got older, there was some pressure in their mind that they needed to do what the crowd was doing. And they would, they would go off to college and eventually find their way to another option. That's important is making sure they understand that they get to choose what would make them happy, despite what, what they may be perceiving. And that's why it's important that we keep our opinions to ourselves, meaning adult probably shouldn't do a whole lot of uh, in pushing certain careers on children, just because maybe their father was this or their mother did this doesn't mean that their children need to do the same thing because they do take that information and they assume that it to be accurate because the adults that love them are telling them that, giving them the opportunity to explore it themselves and come up with some of their own ideas. I think a lot of that has to do with how adults define success. So many people believe in order to be successful, You need at least a four-year college degree, and you need to be making a lot of money. Absolutely. And I think we do that whether we intend to or not push that college education is the way to go. But I also think we are evolving. We are promoting, we as a society are promoting the trades even more because we're recognizing clearly our services and our trades are what's keeping a lot of this, a lot of us afloat and they are making good money. Sometimes it's just about getting that information out there to students and for them to see that you can be very successful in one of those fields promoting that. But I, I think as a society, we're evolving and we're making, um, we're, we're making strides. The key though, is for these middle school students to identify what track they want to apply to in high school. Well, at the high school level, we had, um, we'd have our traditional career fair, but we would, and then we would offer the college application boot camp, And then we added a vocational, we're going to say boot camp for the sake of that, again, at the high school level, so it doesn't resolve it for lower levels, but the same program, the same opportunity to help the trade school student or the vocational student go through that process, because we're so fixated sometimes, I think, on teaching them how to follow the college process that we forget that these students left behind who are not doing that need support through that process as well. And recognizing that they can get a lot of these programs to their local community college rather than a trade school. So we've got to support them in making sure they understand that these programs are available all over, which is the same concept we could extend to the middle school and teaching them that these opportunities do exist and how to reach out and and get them and how to pursue them. Back to the high school level, when the state says you have to have so many math credits or you have to have so many science credits, are there classes offered in the trades that actually fulfill those requirements? So the vocational, whatever, career and technical ed classes don't fulfill the math or science requirements. Um, However, a lot of their curriculums do support 
the math and the sciences. I, I like to think that there's a lot of crossing across the curriculum there as far as what they're learning, but they do not fulfill those requirements. There is the finance course that is a graduation requirement, but again, not necessarily fulfilling a science or math requirement. What type of vocational training is offered in your county? I'll start at the high school level. There is a business section, which includes marketing, finance, computer information systems. And then there is a trades and industry program department that offers um, building trades, horticulture, landscaping, welding and sheet metals now evolved into a construction course so they offer all of those in addition to ROTC, even the Teachers for Tomorrow is, is a CTE workforce development class with added coding and computer, additional computer classes, cybersecurity and such. So those are the programs that are offered at the high school level. They do start at the middle school level. And I have learned recently that they are trying to add additional programs at the middle school level that will be more seamless with the high school level courses. That's exciting. It is very exciting. It really is. And then of course, you've got the elementary that has the um, STEM program, which is wonderful to see what they do with those kids, how innovative a lot of those things are. So I certainly don't, I would, I would be remiss if I did not mention what the elementary schools do particularly in the STEM program. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, they get to do so many variety of things. So for example, the computer, the, the coding and such for those that are involved in that, but I've watched them do some engineering type lessons, even with our youngest children. So for example, we were planning, and I'm not sure how far the teacher ended up going after COVID hit, but we were planning on showing them how to lift rockets. So we had a donation of rockets. They were going to learn to put together with their STEM teacher. And then we were going to go outside and this professional was going to come from the base and show them how rockets take off. In that class, they engineer things. So she gives them the opportunity, particularly here at our school, to have some items and figure out a way to make those items produce something or fulfill a need. Maybe it's how to get something from point A to point B with just those items, how to build something. I think they were building cars um, and they had to find their own items within their house because we were virtual, all virtual at the time and build something with those items. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in that. At the elementary level, it's, it's you know fairly close to what I would consider a career and technical education opportunity. One of the places I took my grandkids was at the NASA Wallops over in the Eastern Shore. And one of the activities that the children did was launch bottle rock. And they used a bicycle pump to help build the pressure and then mm. launch these two liter bottles you know, of water. It was fascinating. And it reminds me of the movie October Sky about Mr. Hickam, who just wanted to be an astronaut and wound up fulfilling his dream. And I keep thinking that it is so important that we expose kids to all kinds of opportunities. So the fact that Dahlgren is working with your elementary school to do that just is just delightful. I'm just really happy to hear that. It is very exciting. The, the gentleman that was going to come and do this more than will and even purchased all of the items for our students. So I do love that our community has people that are so interested and so willing to support our students in learning. That is key is you have to have community support. Absolutely. And, and we do just are extra fortunate to have the base right here. The bank comes here when we're in person, and obviously not right now, but um, NSWC sets up a table at our school once a week, and they do banking with the children. And that's pretty neat. They're teaching them the banking system. So they come in and they make deposits, and they're here to greet them to do that. And that's a really exciting community opportunity that our school benefits from. To sum up our conversation, how can grandparents help launch their grandchildren on paths that will lead to satisfying careers. 
So use the network, get out there and go to the places that you can. Um, when travel is possible, I think travel is an amazing opportunity for students to see, children to see things. Stay connected with the school. Maybe maybe some of these parents or grandparents would be willing to share some of their experiences with their child's classroom and expose that opportunity to a lot more children. Also, I think it's important that we talk about the vocabulary. We use the words so that the first time students are hearing about career or a language that we use, it's not coming from school, that maybe it's coming from home, that would be an advantage for young people. It's just so important that they understand what, what brings them some joy and happiness is, is ultimately what their success will be. For the grandparenting segment, I would like to introduce Denise Thomas, a new grandparent who also is a college funding expert. Parents and grandparents hire to discover how their children and grandchildren can go to college debt-free. You will find links to her website and social media in the show notes. Denise, tell us about your services to help grandparents and parents launch their uh, kiddos onto a debt-free college track? The problem I see today with, well, it's been happening for the last 30 years, in my opinion, is that we have way too much college debt going on. And with my research, with my own kids, I found that that really wasn't necessary. It, you don't have to have college debt. So I partner with parents to put their kids through college debt-free. Uh, grandparents have been part of this solution as well, which is why I'm really thankful that you had me on your show today. It doesn't have to be debt. It's not a requirement. There are so many ways that uh, kiddos can, can get their degree without the mind-boggling amounts of debt that we see today. I know one option is for families to fill out the federal application FAFSA and that possibly can link families to grants and scholarships, but how else can families find finances? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the FAFSA because uh, to be, be honest with you, many families believe that, well, we make too much money, so why bother? Or maybe my kid doesn't have, or my grandkid doesn't have, you know, a 4.0 GPA, so why bother? Again, there are so many myths that are surrounding the high school to college process, and I really want to clear up some of those myths. First of all, make sure that your grandchild is filing that FAFSA, Federal Application for Federal, I'm sorry, Free Application for Federal Student Aid in their high school senior year. It is really important. It's free. They don't have to pay any money to file it. And the colleges that they apply to will get a copy of this information and whatever, whatever their calculation formula is for scholarships and grants will pop out something for an offer for your, for your grandchild, some type of financial offer. But that's not the only way to get free money for college or to, to reduce that college cost. What is another way that families can apply for financial aid? The definition of financial aid for most people is need-based. In other words, if the family has a really low income, they, they have grants that are available not only through the federal government, but also some private colleges offer financial aid for need-based uh, students. So that's one way. Another way is academic or merit-based scholarships. And merit means something the student themselves does, not based on the parents' finances. So that can be an art scholarship, it can be music, it can be athletic, or it can be academic, which is based on their GPA and perhaps even their, uh, their test scores with the ACT or the SAT. I'm looking at your website now, and one of the things that I've always preached to my children and to my students, I'm now a retired teacher, is that it's really important to look at career exploration from a young age. 
And on your website, you say that parents should contact you when their children are in sixth to eighth grade. And I know as a high school teacher, having knowledge coming into high school impacts the courses that you take and a child's attitude toward grades. So is that part of your your promotion is to tell middle school students how important it is to pick the right classes? Absolutely. And it's not just the right classes, also the right activities, both school activities and extracurricular activities outside of the school programs. One of the things that I think parents have been told and and children have been told for years is don't start looking at colleges or anything related to college, even taking college entrance exams until junior or senior year. But the problem with waiting is that the student may not have had the right college course, I'm sorry, high school courses that the colleges are gonna value for college admissions. They may not have done the right activities that are gonna promote again, college admissions and scholarships. So if the parents contact me in that middle school timeframe, then they can get started on the right foot. They've had time to, as you said, assess, what their children might really be interested in for a career choice. And I know it sounds early, but it's really not. It's mostly with parents, it's mostly being aware of your child's, um, you know, what is it that they enjoy doing? What are their, the things that, that really, you know, float their boat, so to speak. You know, I've had parents say, well, you know, my kid has been playing, you know, baseball or football or some other sport since they were three years old. And that's awesome. So my question to parents at that point is, okay, so is Johnny going to play college ball? The answer is almost always, well, I don't know, he's 12. Okay, and here's the problem there. Children who who really have the skill set, the talent to play college ball are basically picked out at age eight and nine. Yes, there are some late bloomers. But it is so obvious, I've seen it myself, in children that were eight and nine years old, they're going to play college ball. They may even play professional ball. And I'm not telling parents, well, then Johnny has to quit. Then we have to ask a different question. The next question is, well, does Johnny love it? Or is he only doing this because mom has been dropping him off twice a week since he was three years old? Because that's what we do. That's a very important question that parents need to assess. If he loves it, now we can work with that because then we can start talking about, all right, well, if he really loves it, then maybe when he's in high school, he can do some assistant coaching or even hold weekend or summer workshops for other kids. This puts something on their college and scholarship applications that is leadership. Very, very important to start looking at those types of things early in their high school career, because today those college applications are going out early senior year. So you really only have three years to get the grades, the courses that they need for high school, as well as the activities. Yesterday, one of my friends posted on Facebook, this is a a teacher I had worked with before I retired. Her son, who has now graduated from college, is the film director for one of the college's basketball program. He, like the example you just used, started playing basketball through the the little league equivalent for the basketball and loved it, played in high school and also had an interest in video. And so what he would do is take video of the games, edit it down to make highlight reels for all of his friends you know, to apply for college. And he's parlayed that interest as well as the skill of his knowledge of basketball and video into a paid job. He worked through college doing that and now the college has hired him. That is fabulous. That's an exactly a perfect example of finding your child's passion and what their interests, where their interests lie. These are the kinds of things that colleges are looking for in the college application, let me give you an example. College applications 
or let's think of it as similar to a, a resume. A resume is gonna have different categories. Well, the college application has different categories as well. They will have a honors and awards category. So if your child has, or grandchild has done any, and it doesn't really, has, doesn't have to be academic oriented at all. They could be in 4-H and have won the cooking contest. That goes in that list. So they have an honors and awards category. They have an activities category. Sometimes there's a checkbox on the activities, whether or not they have just have been some type of leadership role. So that will be a checkbox. And the checkbox will also be if it was an, a school sponsored activity or a non school sponsored, basically extracurricular. So parents need to keep track of those kinds of things. I tell people, okay, so you know you took pictures of your kid doing this stuff. Go back through your photographs on your phone because that's an easy way to keep track of some of that. Another category will be, of course, academic, what courses they've taken. And one of the things that parents don't realize is when colleges are, are assessing for admissions, one of their big questions is, where will this child fit into the ca campus community? And what that means is, if let's say someone, you know, a child really enjoys playing chess, they started the chess club at their school, maybe they even did chess tournaments, all of that ends up on that application. Matter of fact, they may have even put something in their college application essay that had to do with chess. Then the college knows, oh, well, this child will definitely, more than likely, participate in the chess club at our school. Or maybe even start one if we don't have one, right? They don't want all high school presidents, class presidents. If you have a bunch of class presidents, well, guess what? The college only has one. There's only one role to fill there. They need to know what other things you have done to see how you fit into the campus community. So that, that's very important uh, for parents to think about long before high school senior year comes along. Well, you know, there's a difference between what we called well-rounded 30 years ago than today. Back in the day, as I call it, from when I was in school, they were looking for the jack of all trades, literally. A little, dabble a little bit in everything. Today, they're looking for focus or passion and they don't want someone who has maybe did maybe they played piano for a year maybe they played sports for a year maybe they were in the church youth group as leadership for a year that's not what they're looking for they're looking for someone who did this one thing or maybe two it can, it can be a focus in two areas like you talked about that child who was involved in basketball but also loved the videography it's great, but it doesn't have to be academic and it doesn't have to have anything to do with their career choice. I'll give you an example. My daughter learned, started learning ballroom dancing at age nine. She ballroom danced and started competing at age 14. She started assistant teaching at age 12. So she had an activity, which was the sport of dance. She had honors and activities honors and awards, was, which was her medals that she won for competition. She also had leadership in there for assistant teaching with this particular activity. Her essay for the college applications had to do with her grandfather introducing her to ballroom dance. Now the college knows where her passions lie. Her academically, her college major was business. Totally different thing. But she was offered many scholarships from many colleges because they could see the focus of where, she, you know, where, where her heart lies, right? Where her passion lies. And they knew where she fit into the college campus community. So it's not all about, you know, like I said, uh, we want the valedictorians. There is a place for that, but that's not a requirement. I think what parents need to realize and grandparents who are helping to assist getting their grandchildren in college and financially with that is that there are some colleges that will give academic scholarships and need-based scholarship, financial need, meaning family's income. There are some colleges that have absolutely zero academic scholarships. In other words, perhaps they 
uh, have a lot of students applying who have 4.0 GPAs or higher, right? Or uh, maybe they are the valedictorians and they've got perfect or near perfect SAT scores, but they don't give money for that because the vast majority of people who are applying have those kinds of statistics. Parents and grandparents need to understand why colleges offer money or discounts as it really is, because very, very rarely does actual cash come into play here. They offer the scholarships as an incentive for that student to go to that school because that student's statistics, their GPA and test scores will raise the college's rankings. College rankings are based on different factors, but one of the major factors is average test score and GPA of incoming freshmen. So a college whose average GPA and test score is the top 95%, right? The top 5% of school, of children, they don't have an incentive to offer scholarships for academics. They've already got those people applying. For example, Harvard. Harvard doesn't give any academic scholarships at all. They only give need-based scholarships. So if your income is, let's say, middle, middle America and lower, there's a really good chance you'll get some type of offer for financial aid based on the family's finances. But I don't care how good those test scores are, they're not giving cash money. Give parents and grandparents three pieces of advice to launch their, their, their children onto the right path. The very first thing that I would say is start early. The earlier you start, the more opportunities there are. Scholarships actually begin as early as kindergarten, which I know sounds crazy, but the later people wait, the more money they've left on the table. So how does a parent of a kindergarten student start looking for scholarships? Well, the good news is that there's only one scholarship for kindergartners. So that's the easy part. That is the Google Doodle scholarship. It's $1,000, it's offered once a year. I don't know how many children win each year, but it's $1,000 and all the kids, you just put a piece of paper and a crayon in front of the child, right? <laughs> it's not that big a deal, no stress here. Um, the other thing is that most scholarship opportunities are just answering a question. Most of them do not require the child to have a 4.0 or even a, a great GPA. Most of them don't even ask for GPA. So it's just they want your opinion on a topic of some kind. The vast majority of scholarships will be for high school seniors. If you think about the traditional bell curve that I think we're all familiar with, where the traditional bell curve for, for grades, there's the majority of C students will be at the top. That's the largest number of people there. We call them average. And then there's the lower end on one side, which is those who did not pass. And then there's the other end on the other side, which is students that have A's. The same is true for scholarships. When you look at a bell curve for scholarships, the vast majority, the top number is going to be for high school seniors. So there may be tens of thousands of scholarships available for high school seniors. There's only one for kindergartners on the lower end on one side. On the other end, there are scholarships for medical school and for graduate school and being a lawyer, you know, going to law school. All the in-between stuff, the rise of that bell curve for numbers of scholarships is everything in between. So there are scholarships for middle school students and high school students that are not yet seniors. There are current scholarships available for current college students and graduate students. So just because your grandchild has already been accepted to their college, I say you're not done yet. They're not done yet. Always look for free money until the last degree is in their hands because the money is there. I interrupted you about the three things. So the first was look for scholarships. All right, what are the, what's the second piece of advice? Yeah, you wanna start early because not just for looking for scholarships, but you wanna start assessing 
in middle school what your child or grandchild's strengths are uh, and things that they might need to work on. Also, I think that one of the things that they should probably do is be really cautious about listening to the typical advice, typical advice, such as don't take the ACT or SAT exam until late high school, junior year. That's what we've been told. But the children who are graduating debt free, most of them started taking those exams for practice in seventh or eighth grade. Not, you know, no putting stress on them, but basically learning from the exams what they still need to work on. So you want, to, you want your children or grandchildren to start taking those exams early. And the other thing that I, that I think is really important that most people don't put a lot of cred into is the PSAT exam. That is the exam that is taken in the high school junior year for National Merit Scholarship opportunities. The vast majority of high school counselors and even private counselors like myself will tell you, uh, it's just a practice SAT, no big deal. It, you know, you have to be a genius to win that. Totally not true. Your children and grandchildren have a better chance of winning, becoming a national merit scholar and winning money from taking that PSAT exam than they do for the local Rotary Scholarship. That's pretty jaw-dropping. Well, one in 200 will become a National Merit Scholar. In your local community scholarship, Rotary, whatever it might be, whatever business that's offering a scholarship, literally every high school senior from every high school in your area is going to be applying for that. I see. One in 200 will win. There's 8,000 National Merit Scholars every year. Name me one other scholarship that has that many winners every year. So the advice is start early with looking at your, your children's interests, look at their strength and remediate deficits. Absolutely. Figure out where their strengths lie, take care of things that are missing. You know, if your children are, maybe they're not getting A's and B's in math. Well, maybe they need a tutor doesn't have to be expensive. You can find another student that's older that did well and maybe pay them $20 an hour. It doesn't have to cost a fortune or even less maybe. Maybe, they, maybe you do something else for them, right? There's opportunities that you know barter for, for something instead of actually paying cash if that's not available. There's a lot of opportunities for children to go to college debt-free. The one thing that I've heard a lot is, well, everybody has college debt because that's what we hear. But the truth is 30% of college students graduate debt-free every year, 30%. You talked about high school students. What about if you're already graduated from college, a four-year college, and you wanna to go to graduate school? There's money for that too? Absolutely, there are scholarships available. And you have to do the same type of research for what graduate school to attend that you did for what college to attend for your undergrad. Because again, graduate schools will have their own scholarships that they'll give. I have a, a girlfriend whose daughter graduated from a local college, local university, did well, had scholarships to that local university, but then ended up going to another state for grad school on another full scholarship. So don't think you have to stay in the same school for grad school or even in the same state. True. Go where the money is. That's what I'm trying to tell people. There are four, there's more than 4,000 four-year colleges and universities in the US. There's a school out there for everyone and there's a plan for everyone. You know, if, if a student is not sure about what they wanna do for their college major, you know, maybe starting at a community college would be the best bet. How do they find scholarships? I have five different ways of finding scholarships. And I go through all of that in my course, Cracking the Cord to Free College, but I also have a separate course that is strictly just finding scholarships. The full course covers more than just finding scholarships. It covers the activities, the courses they should take in high school, how to find a college, their resume, their applications, everything, and the essays, the whole thing, whole kit and caboodle. 
but just finding scholarships starts from home. Start with, okay, do the parents work at a company that offers scholarships for the children of employees? A lot of people have no idea. They've never asked that question, but a lot of companies do offer that. So start at home, then start branching out into your local community for scholarships and then your state and don't go to national scholarships until you've exhausted those resources locally as well. But there's also a strategy for looking for national scholarships so that it doesn't overwhelm your inbox and, you know, make you go nuts going, you know, what should my child actually apply for? There are more than 23 billion, that's with a B, dollars worth of scholarships available every year. So when your child is looking at the essay question for a particular scholarship, if they are sitting there racking their brain like they have no idea what to write, it's like pulling teeth, put it in the trash. There's plenty of others out there. They have a much better chance of winning a scholarship when they care about the topic and can write from the heart. I think the overall message that I hear from you today is passion, that a student has to really wholeheartedly believe in what he or she is doing, either the hobby or what the prospective career is going to be. They have to have some type of a, I don't, I don't know what to call it exactly, but if you have no clue, don't waste your money on college until they have a clue. Get out, let them get out in the world, let them at least have some local job opportunities. You know, when when my children were a little older, old enough to work for different places, I would ask, well, what is it that you like about that job? And what is it you don't like about that job? Because you'll at least find out whether or not they would prefer working in an office behind a desk or at a computer, or would they prefer being with the public and interacting with the public all the time? Because those are two completely different types of jobs. There are also job assessment type things, career assessments online. Some are free, some cost a little bit, some cost a lot. So look around, there's plenty out there. But yeah, there's, there's so many opportunities. Don't miss the opportunities. Don't wait. Do your best to continue looking for these things. Now, I will say the student has to be involved. I've had a few parents, not very many, thank goodness, who have called me and said, hey, Denise, I really, I want to you know, hire you for your services. I really want my child to graduate debt-free. That's, that's my passion. That's what I want them to do because I understand, you know, finances when you're broke, when you graduate from college, you start off broke, but I don't want them to have that debt. And then they tell me their son or daughter really doesn't care. They believe college debt is inevitable and they'll just have it college debt. And I will tell them, I'm not going to take your money. The parent or grandparent can only do so much. They can fill out the basic parts of the application. They can put name, address, phone number, blah, 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 fill out the grades, whatever. But bottom line is the student has to write the essay. And if, and if they don't care, that's going to come through in the essay. Give your kids and your grandkids opportunities during middle school to find their passion. For example, there are a lot of opportunities for parents and grandparents to observe their children and grandchildren, you know, anytime they're with them, what is it that they seem to like or not like? There are interest surveys online that they can take as well, but some of it may be just attending summer camps of a variety. Many summer camps are free or very, very inexpensive. For example, I sent my children to pretty much every free summer camp that I could drive them to. They all have a different theme, a different idea, whatever. They're, obviously, they're going to be with different people. It may even be with different churches. It doesn't matter. There was one summer, I think my son might have been about 12 years old. And I had him signed up for five camps that summer, five week-long camps. We get to the fifth one on the first day, and he says, so tell me again why I'm going to this camp. This is the answer. Because my job is to give you opportunities your job is to find your passion. That last camp happened to be at NASA. They had a summer camp for children. It was an hour and a half drive. So I found some other parents that I could carpool with so I didn't have to drive every day. When we got to the last day, 
and I'm about to walk my child to the parking lot to the car. I stopped on the sidewalk and I said, son, you haven't talked to me much about this camp all week long because he's a boy and they don't talk to you very much. That's just what most of them do. So I asked him, what did you like or not like about this camp? His response was, well, I like the robots. And then he paused and said, no, what I really liked was programming the robots. I said, son, I have a degree in, in computer programming. We can do that. It took me a couple of years, but I finally found a, a program online. It was very inexpensive that homeschool parents can you know, order and purchase for their kids and teach them how to do some computer programming. It was very, very easy. So that's what we did when he was a high school freshman, I believe. Then fast forward, college. He decides to major in mechanical engineering. His favorite thing in the entire curriculum is doing the computer-aided design. For every project, that is the part that he did for any team project that he was assigned to. He ended up graduating with a degree in mechanical engineering and a minor in aerospace engineering. And today he works for a military contractor, his dream job. You never know what little opportunity you offer your child that is going to spark and really just shoot them through to their, their life. So always look for opportunities. Many, many, many are either very inexpensive or free. And if it seems expensive to you or your family, call them, ask if they have any scholarships for families that can't afford it. Many of them do. So look for those opportunities. And if, if we are still stuck between, behind a wall in COVID this coming summer, look online for opportunities. There are opportunities even through YouTube for your children and grandchildren to learn new skills. There are opportunities to even be certified in different skills if they are high school age in most cases. Those certifications end up on their resume even as a youngster. The whole premise of my book I'm writing is Adventures with Grammy. And it is to expose children to experiences they might otherwise not know about and to present them with early career exploration opportunities. And I'm passionate about that, which is also the reason I started this podcast. So everything that you're saying just fits right in with what I'm trying to help parents and grandparents understand. Excellent. Well, I'll give you another example. The grandparents and parents, but grandparents also have skills. You have skill sets of your own. Teach them to your grandchildren. When they're visiting with you, if you have a weekend with them, teach them what you enjoy. If you enjoy cooking, teach them how to cook. If you enjoy dancing, teach them how to dance. That is how my daughter learned ballroom dancing. My, my dad was babysitting my two children when my husband and I were out of town for a week. He got bored. At one point, they, you know, they had pretty much done everything he had on his list, like taking them out for ice cream or going to the nature museum. And he said, you want to learn how to waltz? Sure. And he taught her how to waltz during that week while they were together. Before you know it, the two of them are giving exhibitions throughout the state and teaching other children how to ballroom dance. Thousands of kids learned how to ballroom dance because he taught his granddaughter something he was passionate about. Tell us where we can find information about uh, Debt Free College and how to contact you. You can find me at getaheadoftheclass.com. On that front page of the website, there is a checklist that you can that's an opt-in. It's a free opt-in. The blog that's on the website has a lot of free information as well. And the information about my courses is on the top tab. Just click courses. For the literary segment of this edition of the Adventures with Grammy podcast, I want to tell you about a few books I found 
that are appealing for each age group. HarperCollins has published a set of books I can read, and in the My Community section, they have several titles. I want to be a pilot, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a veterinarian, I want to be a police officer, and I want to be a teacher. For children ages 8 to 12, Lisa Gary has written 100 Things to Be When You Grow Up. And for ages 13 plus, there are two titles. The first is The Graphic Guide to Planning Your Future, published by DK Children. And the second is the teenage version of What Color Is Your Parachute? Discover Yourself, Design Your Future, and Plan for Your Dream Job by Carol Kristen and Robert N. Bowles. Also, if you go to my Pinterest site, you will find a number of resources. You will find the link to my Pinterest account in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Adventures with Grammy podcast. If you did, I would like for you to do two things for me. One, hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss any episodes of the podcast and ask your family members and friends to do the same. The second thing is to visit the website, adventureswithgrammy.com, and look on the menu bar and click on the link, Newsletter Sign Up. That will give you access to my monthly newsletter. Also, ask your family members and friends if they will sign up too. Please feel free to contact me, carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com, with any comments or suggestions. Thank <laughs> you.